Hey, what's going on guys? So I've got a cool new episode for you here today. I actually did an interview with NLP coach Peter Schwartz. I can't wait for you guys to check this out. Let's jump in. Hey everybody, it's Daxton Page. Welcome back to Musician Mastery. Thank you for joining us here today. So I've got a special guest that I really think you're going to enjoy. A lot of musicians out there, sometimes we struggle with our beliefs about ourselves and our ability to achieve things in entrepreneurship because as you guys know, when you try to become a professional musician, you're now an entrepreneur. And so there's a lot of things and beliefs we have to break down. And then sometimes we're trying to be more charismatic. We're on stage trying to persuade people to come and listen to our music, join our world, and I think our special guest is actually going to help you guys out a lot with, uh, with those things. Uh, Peter Schwartz is a fully certified NLP coach since 2010. He's been successfully coaching clients throughout the Los Angeles and Washington, D.C. area and facilitating their self-growth. His coaching program utilizes evidence-based procedures to make promises of personal development real to you and your business. Peter, thank you for joining us here today. Thank you for having me, sir. I'm excited to be here. Awesome, man. So I just want to kind of introduce some people because I know they may not actually know what NLP is and, and things like that. So if you could explain what exactly is NLP? Yeah, so it's a interesting question and it's depending on who the audience is, my answer will change. Interesting. Uh, so it, from a coaching perspective, the reason why NLP is my favorite toolkit within the coaching toolbox is because it gives me a direct way to help people change their thoughts, their feelings, and to me, most importantly, their beliefs. So I'm not going to bore you with the whole, um, you know, beliefs create self-fulfilling prophecies spiel that I, uh, people who know my channel, I've heard it a thousand times. Uh, but for me, that's why it's the most important is that it gives me a very predictable way to say, okay, th this is the behavior that I'm engaged in. These are the thoughts I'm having here, the belief systems that I'm using. For me, NLP gives me a way to help clients shift or change that very predictably. So by the end of the session, we can test and say, did it work? Did it not work? And so that's what I use it for. Now, NLP is also a communication model. So a lot of sales, persuasion, leadership, seduction, NLP has infiltrated itself into all of these other categories as well. And so sometimes it's taught that way. And then what's another good? Oh, lastly, uh, it's also a modeling technology. Hmm. So because NLP allows you to... Um, discover, let's say there's a genius. And it, like, if we had Jimi Hendrix, for example, and we wanted to know what are his beliefs, right? What are his strategies unconsciously? What is he doing at the level of his unconscious that we could then take those and transport them into a brand new guitar player and probably shortcut uh, their learning curve significantly. So it's a coaching modality. It's a communication model. And it's also a uh, modeling tech as well. Wow, that's really interesting. And so I think there's so much utility in that for artists. You know, sometimes we're sitting around and we're trying to get in a state of creativity. And we've been yeah. there before, but sometimes it feels in less in our control when we can just get in that state when we need to create. And so how might NLP help an artist, let's say, have a predictable way that they can get into state, so to speak. Yeah, uh, totally. So the, 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 you're, you're almost setting me up for an anchor, right? And so I'll, I'll answer that question uh, with the anchoring modality. And then I'll also give you another way to think about it completely. So uh, one of the favorite techniques to come out of NLP is this idea of state elicitation and then anchoring. So uh, through language, I can help guide you into a specific state, right? So if the state is creativity, so there's been a time where you were totally on and you were just able to write the music, right? You were inspired, or maybe it was after a bad breakup. That's when all my best poetry comes, right? <laughs> so um, Absolutely. <laughs> whenever it was, there was a time when you were like, things were just flowing. And so... 
if uh, through language, I can help you revivify that experience to the point that the way that you're thinking and the state itself comes into your full conscious, unconscious, like full mind body awareness, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, there's this principle in neuroscience called Hebb's law. And Hebb's law states that neurons that fire together, wire together. And this is in NLP, we call it anchoring, but it's really the foundation of learning itself that you experience this at the same time that you're experiencing this. And then your brain, if that happens consistently enough, will literally wire those two things together. So one way to do it would be to help the artist elicit a state of creativity and then have them repeat a certain gesture as they go into the peak of the state, do that enough times. And then once we have an anchor, have them think about the time when they wanna be creative and then fire off that anchor at that moment in time. So that's 50% of the answer. Okay. The other 50% is that most of the time when we're not in the state we wanna be, we're trying to consciously left brain get ourselves into that state. And the conscious mind is very good at certain things. It's very good at um, linear thinking, right? Um, logic, that type of thing. Emotions and states are right brain phenomenon. So what NLP is extremely good at is giving you a series of tools to bridge that gap between left, left brain logical and right brain, which is more of the gestalt, the, the states, the values, uh, the meaningful whole, if you will. And yeah. so just to give you uh, an example, yeah. I was recently at a training with uh, John Grinder, who's the co-creator of NLP. Yeah. And John is telling us about what he called the demon state. And, and we asked him like, why, why would you call it the demon state? And he said, it's, it's, a, it's a marketing buzzword, basically. It's sexy. It had, it had curb appeal. Okay. But, but the whole thing about, yeah, depending on yeah what curb you're on, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but, <laughs> uh, but they were modeling this uh, composer who described being possessed by the demon of composition. And that when he would get this demon state, he like it would just come to him. And it's like his conscious mind would go somewhere else and things would just flow. And so what he had learned to do is how to ritualize the state by locking himself into a certain room at a certain time and having a ritual that made it very conducive for that state to be there. I've heard, and I, I'm friends with a lot of artists, that sometimes the way, you can tell me, sometimes the way that artists like to get themselves into state is by you know, um, shutting off the conscious mind via the use of drugs or alcohol or, um, you know, yeah. something in the extreme. Absolutely. That there, really uh, yeah. there is definitely a lot of artists that will use that as sort of a, um, it, I, you know, there's different thoughts on it. To me, it's a cheap shortcut to creativity, though for certain yeah. minds, I could see how something like cannabis, which could take a mind that's, you know, going a little too rapidly and then just kind of slow it down. I've seen how that's benefited mm -hmm. a couple of artists, but yeah, that is, that is something that a lot of artists, I think, unfortunately go down the path of like, well, I'm not feeling it. I'm not in that creative state. I'm not in that creative state. So I need this uh, external stimuli to help get me there as a shortcut. Where as, yeah. as what you're describing, there's actually mental models that we can use to elicit those states within ourselves without those things. Yeah, a hundred percent. And most people are only gonna have uh, one creativity strategy that they're familiar with. So this is beyond my scope of NLP because I haven't modeled a lot of artists. Mm -hmm. um, like what I could help somebody do is figure out what's your creativity strategy. Make sure that when you want it, it's there. Um, but let's say I had modeled 10, 20, like if you, if you found 20 amazing musicians and we wanted to know what their creativity strategy was, mm -hmm. You could also install different musicians uh, creativity strategies so that you, you don't just do creativity one way. Now you have, excuse me, yeah, more choices. That's, that's great. Yeah, that's kind of something that I've, you know, I didn't know that necessarily it was, it was modeling, but when I was like learning how to play guitar, for instance, I would go to this one guy. So there's be a guitar player yeah. like Steve Vai, 
and I would just go and I would learn as many of the songs as I could. And I would also, I would notice that the way I played the instrument, I was also picking up some of his like mannerisms, like the way he would yeah. slide into notes and stuff. I noticed I was doing it the same way because I was so entrenched in modeling that person. And then once I felt like, okay, I've learned all that I can, you know, get from Steve, I go to the next person to do the same thing. It's, it's kind of funny how those kind of, that it, like you said, it's the foundation of learning kind of, you know, you, you're, you're, yeah. You're seeing so, how it's represented in an effective way and learning how to emulate those strategies. Yeah. So you're not a novice to NLP. You've heard of this. You're, you're, what's yes. your experience with it? So for me, I've just been a big like, wow, what is this? And I've just kind of, I've considered myself more of a student. So I don't, I don't talk about it very much with like my audience on Musician Mastery. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure maybe some people have some experience with it. But for me, like, I, uh, I discovered Awaken the Giant Within when I was probably about 18 yeah. or so. And then I was like, okay, that's right. an interesting concept. You know, Tony Robbins is probably the, the gateway drug to NLP yep. for a lot of people. Um, <laughs> sure. but that was kind of my initial <laughs> introduction into it. But I was like, I totally enamored with the idea of like using NLP on myself. You know, like yeah. I think one of the things that I did early on was uh, kind of like positive association and, you know, negative association. I think he calls them neural associations. You know, uh, yep. Freud talks yep. about, you know, being driven towards uh, pleasure and away from pain. And so I was trying to lose weight. And so I associated mm -hmm. like great pain with not achieving that goal because mm -hmm. I found that like the pleasure of getting six pack abs wasn't really pushing me, you know. So yeah. sometimes yep. it takes a, a negative neural association to get you to actually to move and take, a, take action. So for me, my experience with NLP has been more of a student. I haven't really I, I haven't been coached by an nlp coach before i've always wanted to go yeah. and like see john grinder uh richard bandler guys like that and see them yeah. in person and learn in person because i know there's just wealths and just yeah total just so much knowledge from those guys that you can get that's uh that's yeah. cool that you had an experience to to you know learn from john grinder how often have you like seen john grinder worked with them and who else have you happened to work with as well so, so I trained with John in, um, I think it was November, December. Okay. And so that was my, I did a three week trainers training with them. Uh, I, I've also trained with Richard. I've been his demo subject on stage and um, story after story there. <laughs> um, and then uh, a lot of self-study. I train, I've trained at a, a variety of places, but th those are probably the names that you're, you're most familiar with Richard and John. That's great. What are yeah. what are some of the ones I wouldn't be familiar with that would definitely be worth looking into? John Overdorf, I, I think, is by far one of the better NLP trainers. Okay. Uh, he's accessible. In other words, uh, God bless him. I love John Grinder. I love Richard Bandler. Uh, but there there is a little bit of a cult following for both of those guys. Mm -hmm. um, so if you if you go to an Overdorf training, you're it's going to be a smaller training, mm -hmm. and you'll have more access to John. Uh, which is awesome. And he's extremely skillful. The other one for self-study and self-learn, obviously, uh, other than me. <laughs> right? I was going to so, say, yeah, everybody, obviously, Peter's yeah. man, right? You know, Obviously, yes, yes. Um, Michael Breen. So Michael Breen is uh, NLP Times. Their digital products are phenomenal. Uh, okay. Some of the um, absolute best at-home study products. Um, and then... Um, the intelligent hypnotist, Sean Carson, Sarah Carson, and Jess Marion. They're exceptional as well. Wow, that's awesome. Okay, I haven't, those are definitely some names I'm going to check out for sure. And I appreciate that. I'm sure my audience appreciates that as well. So mm -hmm. one of the things I wanted to know is like, what got you into NLP? What was the thing that's like, oh my gosh, I have to learn more about this? Yeah, uh, so <laughs> uh, my parents... I'm going to give you a, a brief life history, okay? Because right? looking backwards, it all kind of connects now. Mm. Um, but so my parents back in the day um, did not have the most loving relationship. They loved each other, right? But it, it was not easy for them. So I learned some things at that time. And, you know, to, to save you on time, I won't go into all of it. Uh, so I think there, but growing up in that family where mom loves me, dad loves me, my brother loves me, but they can't get along with each other. 
and they behave in some quite nasty, aggressive, and sometimes abusive ways to each other. Mm -hmm. um, I think it set me off on a path of um, trying to be a healer, a fixer, and a savior, right? Yeah. Uh, and so that was, and then I also had a natural um, propensity towards it. Uh, since I was a kid, I, for some reason, could hear and listen to people in ways that they weren't getting elsewhere, which is a little bit of a strange thing for a kid to do. Yeah. yeah. Um, fast forward, my dad goes to an NLP training when I'm approximately 16 or 17 years old, right? So he, he studied with Michael Hall. And he comes, you know, I'm trying to watch The Simpsons. It's my favorite show of all time, right? I'm trying to watch Homer be Homer. <laughs> and there's my my Homer, my dad, you know, and he's walking up and down the stairs chanting, the map is not the territory. The map is not the territory, which is an NLP presupposition. Mm. Uh, basically, you know, the, um, your beliefs about reality are not reality themselves, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So I'm thinking, what is this lunatic talking about, right? Fast forward, I end up in college and I cannot motivate myself to go to class. Um, so I end up flunking out and um, I, for whatever reason, cannot get myself to sit down and do the things that I know that I have to do, mm -hmm. right? And this um, sh shatters my self-esteem shatters it because I, I recognize at one point I've been talking about going to class. I've been talking about, you know, doing studying. I've been talking about quitting smoking. I've been saying these things to myself for three years. And suddenly one night it hit me because I was like, you know what? I'll study next semester. I'll turn my grades around. Everything's going to be great. And then a, a voice in my head goes, oh, you're full of shit. You've been saying that for three years. You're not going to do shit. And that shattered my self-esteem. I realized I had no agency over myself. Now, of course I did. I just didn't know where the buttons were, so to yes. speak. Yes, yeah. Right? Probably the belief structure too it plays a part in that as well. A hundred percent. Yeah. A hundred percent, yeah. Um, so, so that self-esteem, right? Now yeah. I'm ashamed of myself. I feel like a little turd, right? And then, uh, <laughs> and then uh, I developed social anxiety. So I, you know, it got so like this social anxiety. I didn't want people to see me. I didn't want them to know anything about me. So I ended up, uh, the social anxiety got so bad that I would have full on panic attacks in public. Now, keep in mind, pretty popular guy. Um, you know, I'm not saying I was like a stud or anything, but I had a lot of like girlfriends, you know? Yeah. So yeah. it was, it was a little bit odd for me to yeah. all of a sudden be afraid of people. Normally, that was being like social, you know, it's being in the social environment and doing social things. It's yeah, it's a left turn. Yeah. 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 I mean, one of the reasons why I flunked out is because I was partying so damn much. Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, <laughs> so all of a sudden I have this social anxiety. I have low self-esteem. I can't get myself to do a damn thing that I know I'm supposed to do. And so uh, long story short, I go back to my dad's bookshelf and I pick up that book that he was reading called NLP for Dummies. And if you know anything about NLP, that's a little bit of a strange title for an NLP book, given that we're so much into language and all Yeah, that. it's kind of against the whole, yeah, yeah, use of yes. language towards yep. oneself and stuff. Uh, yep. So, I'm, uh, so anyway, I read that and then I'm like, okay, uh, this was also the time of the internet. So allegedly I may have pirated a bunch of things, allegedly. <laughs> allegedly, you know. And, yeah. Yep. And at the time I was also smoking a lot of weed. So uh, I was listening to hours of NLP content um, till the point where it just all went into the background. And, mm -hmm. and so um, at some point I probably like picked up a lot of it before I even went to my first training. Mm -hmm. And then I go to my first training and my first training was with Richard Bandler. And nice. I, I really, really bought into the modeling concept which was, if you're going to learn something, go learn it from someone who's good. Yeah. So I was like, if I'm going to learn NLP, I'm going to see Richard. Yep. Right. And sure enough, I learned some things. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say, yeah. What a character, man. I've, I've seen some just clips oh that they're actually like, 
I haven't been able to find them recently. I don't know if they've been just kind of chopping down on copyright or whatever, but yeah, I remember watching some clips like, wow, that's such an unorthodox way of approaching like a crowd and stuff, but he's so effective and I love his storytelling abilities. And I, I, you did a video on loops or nested loops. And Mm -hmm. once, once I saw that, I was, anytime I was watching, um, someone like Tony Robbins or really anybody who does any kind of stage one to many selling or just any kind of presentation. Yeah. I was watching, I was like, Oh, there's another, okay. Opened another loop. There's yep. another one. And I, Richard though, I loved, I loved analyzing his cause he was so just story into another story into another story. And I was, just, it's kind of hard to keep it all together without watching it a thousand times. But you know, that's so cool that that was your very first, like, okay, I'm going straight to the top going to Richard Bandler. I volunteered for every demo. Like when they were talking about who has this problem, I was like, I have that problem. <laughs> yeah. You know, even if even for stuff I didn't have, I, I was determined. I was like, this man is going to hypnotize me. Mm-hmm. And I, I wanted to, I wanted to know what it was like for somebody who is exquisite to do change work. And it's different. I mean, it's really different. Like the quality of the state I went into when Richard did his work with me, the quality of the state I, you know, I got a chance to interact with John, you know, the the, the difference between somebody who knows what they're doing. And, you know, I went to this place here in California, I won't name them. um, But this guy did a state elicitation on me and started anchoring a state that was not there. He was like, all right, so now you feel confident and, and you know, set the anchor. And I was like, I don't feel confident, dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what yeah. you're talking about, like, <laughs> like you just anchor. Um, you will so be confident. <laughs> yeah, it's not exactly. quite how that uh, kind of works. Yeah, now I feel awkward. <laughs> no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, was, I, I was like, I'm not feeling. So I, then I, he anchored un- uncertainty. Mm-hmm. And then uncertainty went into, does this guy know what the fuck he's doing? Yeah. So... He, he ended up anchoring uncertainty plus disbelief. So anyway, I, I ah. say that just because uh, I, I think it was a good decision. Uh, I have worked with a lot of Nelpers and there is a big difference between somebody who knows what they're doing and somebody who does not. So, yeah. yes. So speaking of people that are phenomenal at speaking from the stage and being persuasive and, and charismatic yeah. from the stage, I think that's something that artists, you know, especially when they're very first starting and they're they're playing in front of people. I mean, heck, I remember my very first show. I met, my legs were just straight and locked, and I was just playing the song. I didn't want to oh look at anybody, you know. Yeah. Let Let's say if I was trying to be more like charismatic and and trying to be more influential to an audience, what are some NLP uh, techniques or tools that could help, let's say, like a lead singer be a little bit more engaging or charismatic to an audience? Yeah. So I'm going to, first, I'm going to violate one of my own rules, which is never prescribe techniques. Mm, So I will, I will give you some answers. uh, But I'm doing that with the caveat of when when we talk about the map is not the territory. If I'm with the client, I, w- I want to work directly with that person's map and mm-hmm. then find out, you know, because if I know their map, oftentimes a new technique will get created just to work within that client's map. Oh. Okay. Yeah. That being said, um, how are they doing whatever the um, limiting state is, first of all? So, so first we have to get rid of whatever the negative state is. So are they chattering to themselves in a really negative voice? Are they visualizing an angry mob booing them with pitchforks? How, how are they creating, right? Like, yeah. how are they creating this? Um, but from, from technique land, you could think about, you know, who do you want to be as a presenter? A- and start to uh, do, you know, like, look at yourself as the rock star or the musician that you want to be. And, and start to begin picturing what does the ideal show look like? And so th- in techniques, these are the swish pattern, new behavior generator, uh, you would have anchoring. But, but the key to making them uh, actually effective is, is twofold. A, you have to embody it. So mm-hmm. when you see, when you think about who's, who's like a charismatic uh, musician, 
So this is more of a modern musician. His name is Johnny Hawkins. He's the lead singer for kind of a hard rock band called Nothing More. He's extremely like okay. has so much energy on stage, but also very good at engaging the crowd to get them hyped up. That, that would be one of my suggestions. Perfect. Perfect. So you just described it's like behavior that you could see. You could see him being energetic on stage. You can see him hyping up the crowd. And what you want to do in your mind is you want to create a video of Johnny Hawkins. Yep. Yeah. You want to have Johnny Hawkins and you want to break it down and like, what are you actually seeing when that happens? And then put a movie right next to it of yourself in the same body language, the same energy, doing the same types of things. So exactly the same way when you describe learning guitar in the beginning, right? You're copying them and then through imitation, but eventually you're going to incorporate what's useful and you'll discard whatever isn't, you know, um, what, whatever is not for you. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's, you know, one way to do it would okay. be, and, and so that would be called the uh, new behavior generator. That's really interesting. I love that. So like, this is kind of one of the things that I'm glad uh, that you use like you know, language, like the swish pattern and stuff. So our students can, or, you know, the people that are in musician mastery can go check out your channel and watch these videos because there's, I think they're super helpful for generating new behavior. Well, it's new behavior generator, <laughs> you know, obviously. Right. But it just right. like right. getting rid of these unwanted behaviors that hold us back. Cause I know lots of musicians, we coming from the creative side of things, we're used to things being not so mm. structured. But when you start a business, mm. things have to be very structured. And so learning yes. to do things you don't normally want to do at first, you know, I feel like these yes. techniques can really help open up, you know, new behaviors, new potentialities, I guess you could say, for musicians moving forward, as opposed to what they've always done that hasn't really gotten them any results. Yeah, I actually really like your tagline. So uh, treating your, your um, art like or now that you're a musician, yeah. I'm, I'm mislanguaging it. I apologize. That's but, okay. you know, being an entrepreneur as, as a, a musician, I've long thought in the background that I wish, like, my favorite musicians um, that I went to college with, I wish they had treated their, their music like a business. And I don't know about you, but I know so many talented, talented guys who I would a thousand times rather be listening to on the radio. For sure. And yeah, and, and it's, it's sad because at this stage, you know, I'm 34. So a lot of those guys that I went to college with have either stopped or they've resigned themselves to never really being successful, uh -huh. which to me is heartbreaking. Yeah, absolutely. Those belief patterns of like, and especially since like the music industry did kind of shift like a, like it, totally got turned on its head whenever like Napster and streaming kind of came onto the scene. So you, you still have artists nowadays that are growing up. And I, like, I see it because I work with, you know, artists one-on-one -on -one all the time. And I see them coming in with the old presuppositions of the old business, you know, and there's right. all those beliefs that right. come with the old model too. So like figuring out what's the new way forward and reconstructing your beliefs. One of the things I'm sure you, you've seen this um, being someone who really studies NLP is uh, the belief loop. That, that Tony Robbins yeah. talks about with belief and potential and action mm -hmm. and result. I feel like things like that, learning how to generate new beliefs that are productive, you know, that are actually mm -hmm. gonna serve you are, are some of the most important skills you can learn in this business because it's, it's, we're fighting against all these forces all the time. You know, comparison, when you're on social media, you see all these artists that are there and you wanna be there yep. and you're like, oh, I'm not there, is it even possible, you know? <laughs> but, but like it's, yeah 100 percent. yeah it's it is possible but we just have all these our map isn't quite updated to to match more of what reality is and we're not modeling who we should be modeling you know we're modeling the old the old way we're modeling the musicians that may have you know had success and like we, we're like for instance there's a band uh that i listen to a lot especially like in college uh chevelle kind of a harder rock band and mm -hmm they're they're doing great honestly considering that they came from the old way of doing things you know the record label picked them up and they had to sign a contract for seven albums and all this kind of stuff right stuff that i wouldn't right. recommend people really just jump into as a you know hey it's my first album with a label let's do seven records you know i wouldn't recommend that nowadays 
but right. young people grow up and they see people that had success in an old model and they start trying to model mm -hmm. the behaviors of someone who did it in a way that it doesn't apply anymore. So sure, sure. what are some of your, what do you look for? Cause I know I've, I've seen you comments on people, let's say who, uh, who are doing NLP very poorly and trying to train people. Uh, <laughs> uh, do I, Oh, I, I hope I don't do that. I no, do, don't I? It was, it was, you know, the, I think uh, Jordan Belfort just had some well-deserved uh, criticism uh, yeah. coming his way, He's honestly, with some of the NLP stuff. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> just me personally. But yeah. how do you discern who are the people mm -hmm. to model versus people that may, you know, be great at marketing themselves as the person to model, but really is, is not the person we should be looking for? That's a really good question. Who to model? Um, okay. So first of all, you've been modeling and, and you kind of pointed it out, right? So people are modeling uh, the success attitudes of their parents uh, at growing up. So, so before the individual even starts their business, they've already accumulated a ton of uh, BS, right? Yeah. And so we have to determine, is that actually serving them or not? Uh, so if, if it's okay, I want to loop back on that before I answer your, your question about modeling. Sure. Um, so just, just so people know how incipient belief systems, I mean, the belief system can either serve you and it can create positive self-fulfilling prophecy or it can create a negative, but it's, it's a lot more than this kind of, you have to believe it for it to manifest. It's, it's literally a feature of your nervous system. So uh, my favorite and why I'm doing this, right, is because uh, when you have a belief, it creates perceptual filters through which you see the world. And so for me, this is filters. <laughs> so, uh, so they do this experiment, right? They take people who believe they're lucky and people who believe they're unlucky. They have them both go into a cafe and they put $100 cash on the floor of the cafe. And over 80% of the lucky group sees the cash, picks it up, puts it in their pocket. Yeah. Less than 12% of the unlucky group even sees the cash at all, right? No kidding. So what's, yes. So, so it's hard to make it in this business, right? I, I don't know a creative who, who thinks it's easy to be successful as a creative. Yeah. And whether or not they're right, it's irrelevant. It's about what is the filter that you want to create that's going to get you to the goal, right? Absolutely. So A, do a good job modeling yourself. Like is the, is the belief that I have today, is this actually going to get me where I want to go? Yeah. Even if it's true, holding that belief is going to create a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we want to be really ecological. I don't want you to be deluded. I yeah. want you to be able to look at reality and say, okay, uh, this many artists do this, this many get in, blah, blah, blah. I want you to be able to look at reality. And I also want you to be able to design a belief system that creates the self-fulfilling prophecy that you like to have, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that's that's the first piece. Second piece, who, who do you model? Um, genius. So you model genius. And you model it in narrow band. Mm. So for example, um, <clears throat> I'm not going to model Richard Bandler for his marketing acumen. I, I don't think he's a great marketer. Okay. I could be wrong. I don't know. Right? Um, I'd model probably Tony. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Br brilliant marketer. Yeah. But. But I, I think what Richard does exquisitely well is he's extremely precise inside of his uh, storytelling, inside of a lot of the things that he does. So I'm going to be very, very choosy. I'm going to model absolute genius in a very narrow band field. And then I'm also going to say, here's what I want to model. Here's what I don't want to model. Mm -hmm. Because some people's unconscious uh, doesn't automatically create a filter to keep out the bad stuff. So uh, there's a story about Stephen Gilligan. When Stephen Gilligan went to go model Milton Erickson, um, he paralyzed himself through the modeling project. And he came out of that modeling project in a wheelchair. Granted, 
his voice tone and tempo were indistinguishable from Milton. And like when they brought him in to see Gregory Bateson, yeah. Gregory Bateson thought it was Milton and oh, he freaked wow. out and he ran it. Yeah. So um, I, I would model genius and, and say, you know, I'm only going to accept the beliefs and attitudes of the people who are doing what I want to do in life. That, I think you, you hit on something that's so important, which is the, the narrow band, right? Mm. You, you, like there's so many artists, for instance, like, you know, uh, if I go to like some really, the, the, the classics, like Charlie Parker, jazz musician, the bird, as they called him, mm. you know, if you wanted to look at a musician to model as far as virtuosity on the saxophone, mm. Charlie was your guy, but as far as modeling mm -hmm. personal life, personal behavior, he was a hardcore heroin addict. And yep. sadly, a lot of people like Miles Davis and John Coltrane that came out of that scene saw Charlie Parker, and though they had a great person to model as far as the technical side and how to create beautiful jazz songs that are complex and abstract, they unfortunately picked up some of those habits that they wouldn't want, which mm -hmm. is, well, Charlie was doing smack, so I guess I have to as well. And that's sadly a narrative that's persisted for a long time. You know, I think something like that happened with something more recent, like in the 90s, I guess you could say uh, something like that happened with Lane Staley of Alice in Chains. You know, again, obviously you can tell I'm a rocker, you know, I'm a solo rocker, you know, but like Lane, he didn't want his fans using smack, but because he, he didn't do, I would say, a good job of, this is something that I think a lot of musicians may disagree with me with, but I feel like there is a responsibility of artists to be mm. uh, careful of the lyrics that they use because those lyrics do tend to just ride in people's unconscious. Um, they, you know, well, and, and so like, what are you that's, projecting into people's yeah. unconscious? Even if you're like, I'm trying to tell a story about something that happened to me, it's like, okay, but maybe mm. I, I just, I, part of me is like, we'll throw in a little silver lining. Just so mm -hmm. that what's ringing around in people's, you know, subconscious is not all negative, because sometimes okay. the context won't matter because you'll just remember the mm -hmm. feeling of and those mm -hmm. and those words that just keep going and going and going, you know. So yeah. Yeah. So this is um, you're inside of an ongoing debate inside of the hypnosis community, which is uh, should you know does listening to pop music and by pop I don't mean pop I just mean whatever music is out there, yep. does that um, does that lyrics actually shift uh, people's consciousness? And so I don't think you could say that it doesn't have an impact. Um, I, I don't think there's any way you could actually yeah. argue that. To me, the, the strongest way to make, like I've, I've listened to a lot of rap. Um, mm -hmm. th there's no chance I'm going to be, um, you know, a gang member, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's just, you know, it's not yeah. happening. Yeah. You know, I'm not, that's not yeah. me, dude. You know, like, <laughs> um, so um, th there's something called attitude formation in mm -hmm. social psychology. And this is actually true in changing beliefs. This is why I have a job is because you, uh, a person might come to you and say, oh, I'm really negative, right? How can I believe in myself? How can I do this or that? And so in attitude formation and social psychology, it's a lot harder to give somebody a, uh, a changed attitude rather than give them a new attitude. Uh -huh. So if, for example, you, you have kids or whatever, if you're doing a really good job giving them a solid North Star, if you're doing a really good job on, you know, um, this is what treating another human being is like, et cetera, that creates a buffer for them. Uh, that will protect them from video games, music, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Gives them a, yes, a way to certainly kind of separate themselves from the the thing, in a sense. Yeah, yeah. A lot of uh, coaches and change workers, they also need to have boundaries as well, so that when a client comes in, like like you know, if you ever talk to a therapist who does way too much trauma work and they don't have a good filter, they, they are done at the end of the day. You know, oh, yeah. like you know. Yeah, um, yeah, because they're so, yeah they're absorbing like a lot of the the feelings and emotion of their clients because there's not a a way to to separate those things. Yeah, 
I've, I've seen some people that are that are trying to become therapists and I noticed that they are very susceptible to these things and so like I, I tr you know you, you don't want to be a dick or anything but you try to be nice like you know you know definitely work on yourself a lot and build a strong solid foundation so you know that like when you're helping other people you're helping people from a port of stability a, a point of stability you know yeah but yeah there are there is definitely a lot of, of therapists out there that don't have that sort of wall so to speak but i i talked to a guy and uh he got back from a, a week-long meditation retreat and, and i was like well how was the retreat he's like oh dude i needed it like after all of the therapy sessions that he had done i was like maybe dude, maybe you should see somebody about the fact that you can't get through a day of work without feeling you know yeah but anyway story for a different time that's all good um so we talked about like, you know, all these different great techniques that we can use while we're trying to be, you know, let's say, you know, we're trying to get into a state of charisma when we're on stage. What are some ways as someone who's on a stage, let's say I have a microphone and I've got an audience in front of me. Yep. What are, what do you think maybe some of the ways I could use that microphone to, mm -hmm. I know, I hope I'm not like, I, you know, trying to get you to prescribe a, a technique again, you know, but like, what, yeah, yeah, we, all good. what, what would be some of the techniques that you could use with a microphone in front of a group of people? Is there anything that's, is it a hundred percent voice and how you use your voice or is there ways to like, I don't know, I don't know, use the mic itself and your, the volume and how the mic projects the sound. I don't know if that, I hope that's making sense. Yeah. Mm. For, for what purpose? To uh, let's say to get an audience to direct attention, you know, because one of the things mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of musicians struggle with is they're like, they're this band that's playing in front of an audience that doesn't know them. So they kind of don't care, you know? Mm -hmm. So how do, how would someone in that position be like, okay, I'm going to try to get this audience to direct their attention towards me or to at least engage in some way, you know, what, yeah. what would you, what would you so, say? So first and foremost is attitude, right? So first and foremost, you have to own it. You have to come when the second you touch the stage and the second you have the microphone, the attitude is your ass is mine. And so you already have the attention before you have the attention. It's an inside job first. So because any technique, anything that I prescribe, if you don't own it ahead of time, is going to fall flat. Mm. So first piece is attitude, right? And I, they're going to pay attention. <laughs> of course, <laughs> it's impossible for them not to. Um, so so that's, that's the first piece is get the inside right. The second piece is you have to know what causes people to focus anyway. Right. So you're, if somebody is in the human nervous system, they are designed to pay attention to certain things and it's irrefutable. So anything that's a survival issue. Right. This is why if somebody all of a sudden touches you, all of your focus goes to either the place where you're being touched or to the person survival issue. Right. Food, sex, uh, loud noises. Yeah. V variety. These things cause focus to become uh, much tighter. Right. Yeah. So um, you have so treat the you know rock the animal as well as the individual. So so there's the primal nervous system. Then there's also an emotional one. People are emotionally stimulated as well. So you want to give them an emotional roller coaster as much as possible. Uh, pattern interrupts, doing things that are unexpected or different. Yes. So if if they go to a gathering in which it's expected that the musician is gonna be up there and we're gonna eat our dinner and they're gonna fall into the background, you cannot fall into the pattern. You have to be different enough that something is gonna fix my attention and then you gotta deliver, mm -hmm. right? So, so that you, you make the return on their attention extremely dopaminergic you give them something that's satisfying when they do look, right? And yeah. satisfying could be shock. It could be an emotional outburst. It could be raw energy, raw authenticity. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's that. Yeah, I mean, you could use the microphone. You could, you know, make noises and do mm -hmm. weird shit with it. Pop um, it, you know. So, <laughs> just Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, do like nunchuck stuff. Um, and then the, the other thing to do is you can also just tell them what to do. Yeah. So the second that you're on stage, you're now an authority figure and people respond to authority figures hypnotically. When I first started learning hypnosis, I thought that it was this magic Kung Fu 
that people sent vibrations at people. I I, I didn't know what to think, honestly. Yeah. But um, I was like, how does, is it the word? Is it the, what is he doing? The tonality, well, yeah, what are those things, yeah. Yeah, 100%. So when you study uh, psychology, when you study influence, when you study hypnosis, you find out that a lot of people will respond hypnotically even when no hypnosis is happening. So if a doctor or a lawyer or a judge or somebody on a stage says, do this, they're going to do it most of the time. So you can just tell them, eyes up here, look, focus, you know, um, you, you can tell them what to do and they will do it. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah, that's that's great stuff. I, I love, you know, like the idea of the variety and the pattern interrupt. I think that's something that's that's going to be insanely important for artists trying to stick out, like, especially in my genre of rock, there is kind of this uh, expectation that like mm -hmm. you just go up on stage and you just, you play the songs and then you just go mm -hmm. to the next song and then the next song and then the set's done and you get off stage. Mm -hmm. And when, like, for instance, the reason I brought up Johnny Hawkins and nothing more is the first time I saw them, like halfway through their show, they brought out this contraption where you set a mm. bass on top of it, but then the bass could swing like this, or what? it could swing okay. like this. It could, it could rotate 360. And so yep. they had the bass player on one side, like hitting the strings, mm -hmm. and then the guitar player was fretting the neck, and it was I was just looking at it like, what what is going on right now? Like, th am I still at a rock show? And that pattern yep. interrupt, I, I've literally been like a huge Nothing More fan ever since I saw that. And they've even, yeah. they've upped it up now where they have what they call the scorpion tail, where Johnny will stand up on this giant thing that has <laughs> levers and it looks like a tail. And like, it's, it's crazy. And so like, when you say like, make yeah. the, the pattern interrupt very dopaminergic, like really just like, what is that? Mm -hmm. That's insane. That's awesome. That was just the first thing that, mm -hmm. that popped to my mind. And I thought that was, yeah, a great example of, of yeah. how that works. Kind of even like you said, you don't have to like, kung fu ninja someone to be influential or, or hypnotic even it's just kind of something that can take place naturally as the authority figure on the stage so that's yeah that's great and stuff. and so yeah. to come back to the attitude piece mm -hmm. do you want to be seen wow. so when you're on stage do you want their attention so um you know like as you become more and more of a performer presumably you're there because you love it Right. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, there's they've um, I can't remember who some guys uh, dating channel and I can't remember who it was. And he was uh, teaching guys how to stop women on the street or whatever and get their full attention when he's talking to them. And he said, you don't want it. He's like, what do you mean? He's like, you don't want her to stop and talk to you. Like, I can tell you don't actually want her to pay attention to you. And then he said, do like, what would it be like if you actually wanted her full attention? And then how would you talk to her? And it clicked for this guy. And then the next one, people are actually stopping and focusing in. So for me, and this is my bias, I'm always attitude first. And so, and then, so if we go back to those techniques and we're saying swish patterns, new behavior generators, I can give you a bunch of techniques. You can steal somebody's routine. Don't do it, obviously. But, yeah. you know, um, what would it like if you picture walking up onto the stage and then heads turning and then people hanging on every movement, right? If you picture that enough times, your brain will start to send resources so that over time, and you'd be surprised how fast it happens. You know, charismatic presence observably is posture, largely posture. Wow. Uh, but some people have the ability to walk into a room and it turns heads. And, you know, the fastest way to get that response from people is do it on the inside. Be in, in your mind. When you want to turn it on, I would not live your life this way. Um, you know, the most, like the, the closest thing that I think I've ever had to being a charismatic master is borrowing my stepsister's dog, this cute little dog. And people are flocking at me, you know, flying at me from across the street. 
right? Yeah. And at, after about 20 minutes of that, I was like, this is enough. Take the dog. I don't want this, you know? <laughs> um, but, you know, for the times that you do want to turn it on, you know, th that can become a switch or a dial that you can crank up, so to speak. Okay. So d do it on the inside first. And then, yes, technique is, I'm full of techniques. And I, I think I would be dishonest if I said I don't use them. Uh, <laughs> but they're, they're, they're not the same without the attitude. Yeah, that's, that's insanely important. Like, because like you said, it's like being sold on yourself. It's like being sold on the, like, some people, they like the idea of things going right. But they're yes. terrified. They're scared shitless of what happens when it actually goes right. You know, like, yeah. now everyone's looking at you. Now what do you do? Like now that's the fears that go through people. Ah. Yeah, you <laughs> yeah, know, exactly. but like yeah. there's that, that belief already of like, you know, I wish people would look at me, but I kind of don't want them to look at me, you know? And even if you don't say that, you can project it mm. via your body language, right? Yes. So that's, that's, I think what you're saying is insanely valuable. You have to be, you have to have the attitude first. You have to have that, those inner beliefs sold on what you're doing first. So when you go out there, there's no, hesitation withdraw any kind of thing like that because audiences yeah. pick up on that you know we we had a lead singer yes. for a long time that was <laughs> my bass player called him the most anti-social lead singer ever <laughs> just because he wanted the the attention but he also didn't because when it was like it came time to banter and engage with the audience didn't want any part yeah. of it but the part during the yeah. song you know when it's just going through the motions you know it's like oh, okay yeah i like it i like it then but yeah, as soon as it's like, okay, well, now we're looking at you. It's like, oh, I don't like that. Right. So there was some inner belief things. There were some blocks coming up, you know? Yeah. And so, so yeah. I think for everyone out there that's watching this, I think these are things that we need to investigate, you know, as we're, you know, we're trying to become the musicians, the artists that we see in our head, you know, a lot of us, and I'm, I'm kind of assuming for the people that are watching the musicians, and I'm, this could be for anything too. We grow up and we're visualizing ourselves doing that over and over and over again, you know, you throw the headphones on, you lay down and imagine that you're playing your favorite song, you know, I feel like we yeah. need to go back to those states of mind a lot more frequently, because we get old, we get cynical, we get all those BS beliefs that, you know, intrude on that. And so I think, you know, yeah. going back to that position of like, I can model those people, I can see myself doing it, that's, that's what's inevitably going to propel people forward, you know, and actually yeah. get them some results. All right, Great so you, brother couple couple more questions and then uh we'll end the, the interview so yeah what, what are your top I'll, I'll i know you probably have like a bunch of books that you love for nlp mm. so mm. Hmm, i don't want to make it too restrictive let's say top five if you could wreck and it could just be top five right now you know because okay. i know that's always changing for lots of people but yeah yeah I don't know. That's that's too tough for me to answer. Because um, I know you, I know you, you I, read I, a lot. <laughs> yeah, um, I think um, Tony's books are always very good introductions, mm -hmm. uh, but do think of it as a gateway drug. Tony is not all, and also Tony's NLP. God, I, like, listen to me criticize Tony Robbins. It's hilarious. It's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Tony's NLP. I mean, like, oh yeah. Um, <laughs> Tony's NLP is very 1980s NLP. Nothing wrong with it per se, uh, but the field has changed significantly. So um, I, I like Tony's stuff. So pick up one of his books. Um, Get Sleight of Mouth by Doug O'Brien. Not for the sleight of mouth, mm -hmm. but for the way Doug explains belief systems. So Doug will explain, you know, every belief is a cause and effect. And it's also a complex equivalence. It's a fancy jargon. Uh, if you read his book, you'll you'll know what that means. And then, God, it's hard. Can't do it. I, I'm so tempted to just to give you a thousand. Um, <laughs> oh man, NLP and uh, the new technology of achievement would have to be my other. Very cool, man. Well, I appreciate it. Now, if yeah. someone wanted to work with you, get some NLP coaching for yes. themselves, help them develop these better belief systems and tools and techniques, uh, how would they do that? So you can go to my website, which is myhighestpotential.com. And there's a calendar link somewhere on there. Or go to my YouTube channel or my Facebook and fill out an application to work with me.
Very cool. Well, Peter, I really appreciate you taking the time to share your wisdom and your knowledge with all the people watching. And hopefully a lot of people got some value out of this so people can go start to change their beliefs and go start becoming the musicians and artists they want to be. Um, do you have any final words that you want to leave uh, our, our audience with? Um, I would say, you know, because I'm assuming your audience is musicians. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I would say this, your advice on treat it like a business is 100% correct. So I, I think you're right on the money there. And to definitely get yourself a coach, uh, you know, people who are in business need coaches. So start, you know, go pro, treat your career seriously. Uh, if you're, you know, if you have something, if you have a talent or a gift that you want to share with the world, in my opinion, there has never been a better time uh, to be able to share that. So take it seriously, get yourself a coach. Awesome. Thank you so much for doing this, Peter. And uh, thank you guys so much for watching this video. We'll see you guys on another Musician Mastery. Take care, everybody.